Good morning and welcome. We are glad you're worshiping with us, whether you are here and in our sanctuary or at home. Uh, please fill out the friendship forms so you know who is worshiping with you. Uh, you've noticed I don't tell you when to stand or sit. That takes time and disrupts the service. Follow along and you're going to be fine. Remember, we're practicing COVID protocols, wearing masks, using hand sanitizer, keeping social distance, soft singing while masked, which is easy for Presbyterians. Um, our children are going to stay with their parents uh, through the service for a while. You can check out all the protocols approved by our session in the green sheet. Um, again, we appreciate your support in this. Thank you, Tammy, Alice, and Justin for donating Christmas trees to Hope Village. And thank you for not donating live trees. I might have been an issue. Please note the information in the green sheet on how to provide disaster relief for our siblings in Haiti. You may also want to go to the PDA Presbyterian Disaster Assistance website. I promise you, you will be astounded at how many places Presbyterians are present throughout our nation and around the world, helping people survive disasters of every kind. Uh, in the green sheet, you will also find additional opportunities to serve as well as important dates. Friends, I will be heading back to Traverse City this week uh, following worship to assist with our move and bring Margie, B, and Boots back with me uh, if you need assistance, please call the church office. They will know how to get a hold of me. And as is becoming my custom, there's a little bit of a mistake in the bulletin. Uh, the Gloria Patri is the wrong one in the bulletin. So we are singing 581 instead of 582. Uh, you'll recognize the tune, and you'll be grateful that Jason brought this to my attention. Uh, God is good. All the time, God is good. Let us prepare our hearts to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. You can stand. We come to this place to search for God. But God is already searching for us. We come to this place to speak to God. But God is already speaking to us. Let us worship and listen for God, who calls us together and leads us home.
beloved, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In, in faith, faith and, and penitence, penitence, let us confess, confess our sin before God and each other. You tell us, O Lord, who may abide in your presence, who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. Yet, O Lord, we do not walk blamelessly. So often we stumble on the path of faith. The truth makes us nervous, and we pretend not to know what is right. Have mercy, O God. Convict us by your wisdom. Cleanse us by your grace. Challenge us by your presence. And by your forgiveness, free us to try again. Amen. Beloved, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ was raised for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Let the people say, Amen. Amen. Beloved, we do receive this new life today. It's not some far-off gift. It's not some far-off place. But we have the privilege of living in the kingdom of God as witnesses to God's love, sharing the peace of Jesus Christ. And so let us do so today. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another with a sign of Christ, peace, COVID edition. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace to you. scripture readings this morning. The first one is Psalm 15, a Psalm of David. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live in your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. This, the New Testament reading is from James 1, verses 17 through 27. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. 
Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and the religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Put my human nature 
Amen. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they thoroughly washed their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honors, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The word of the Lord. Would Jesus wear a mask? Yes, I'm going there. (laughs) Hearing the gospel of Mark this morning makes us wonder. The scribes and Pharisees question Jesus because his disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. Are we to take from this that Jesus doesn't care about public safety? And personal hygiene? No. Like most church fights, this isn't about the particulars. The scribes and Pharisees aren't germaphobes. They're they're not arguing about hygiene. They're fighting about power. Who has the authority to make the rules? Calling Jesus out for breaking with tradition They want to undermine his authority, his standing with the people. Ironically, I think that's part of the conversation around COVID and the question of safety protocols. Who's in charge? Who are you to tell me I must wear a mask? I can't visit my family. I must keep my distance. Who are you to tell me I must get vaccinated? Many of us see COVID protocols as a threat to our freedom. I get it. Remember the Tuskegee experiment? 600 black men who hadn't given their consent were part of an experiment studying the natural history of syphilis. 399 men had the disease and they were denied treatment. I get why people, particularly black Americans, might have questions about government mandated COVID protocols. Everyone should have a measure of autonomy when making decisions about their health. 
But we must also remember polio, smallpox, rubella, and a host of other preventable diseases, some almost eradicated because of vaccines. Even flu shots are relatively effective. I had pneumonia five times before I had the pneumonia shot. Sometimes the government gets it right when safeguarding public health. So would Jesus wear a mask? Would he follow safety protocols? Would he get vaccinated? Yes. Sure. Jesus had a great immune system. He's God. Did he ever get sick? If he did, he probably healed himself. Yes, Jesus would wear a mask. He knew better than any of us. Life wasn't just about him. Questions about public health aren't about our freedom. Questions about public health are about the common good. Yes, Jesus would wear a mask. Jesus would follow safety protocols. Jesus would get vaccinated, not for his sake, for ours. COVID protocols are about the common good. The questions to ask aren't, what gives you the right? Who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? The questions we must ask if we are to be the body of Christ, if we are to love as Christ loves, the questions we must ask are, what can I do to help you? What can I do to keep you safe? I get it. We're all tired of COVID. We're tired of the uncertainty and the anxiety. We're tired of the protocols. Try climbing the stairway to heaven wearing a mask. Life is harder under COVID. There are churches in our presbytery where people have stopped going. Not because of COVID, but because of COVID protocols. I've not heard if any of our folks feel that way, but I get it. If they do, we'll care for them nonetheless, and they'll always be welcome to return. Beloved, we have over 50 unvaccinated children here throughout the week. We have their families, our preschool and church staffs, their families. We have all of you and the many other folks we serve. Some have compromised immune systems. We'll do our best following protocols to keep everyone safe and move our ministry forward. It's who we are. Loving others is the heart of our faith. It's what Jesus would have us do. Choose this day who you will serve. Could Joshua have said it any better last week? The people responded with an unwavering conviction and steadfast faith. Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it was the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt. Therefore we will serve the Lord. For the Lord is our God. But what does it mean to serve the Lord? What does it mean to serve God? 
How are we to follow God's law? What is the heart of our faith? God's people didn't agree in the first century any more than we do today. The Levites, the priestly families in the line of Aaron, centered in Jerusalem, the, the Levites advocated the faithful observance of the temple practices. The Zealots focused on overthrowing Roman rule as they believed it was impossible to follow God under Roman oppression. The Pharisees, whose power was in the regions outside of Jerusalem, modified the temple laws to be followed by those who were living in villages and towns. We must remember the debate generated by their respective positions over what it meant to serve God wasn't necessarily adversarial. Such discussion was encouraged and essential for a greater understanding of what was required to serve God. This morning, the Pharisees take the debate too far. Hostile to Jesus' ministry, they look for a way to undermine his authority. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, in vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Their argument, Jesus and his disciples ignore the requirements of the law, especially those requiring ritual purity. Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. His disciples pick grain on the Sabbath. They don't fast. Jesus healed a paralyzed man on the Sabbath. When he did it a second time, the Pharisees were determined to destroy him. Their concern isn't for the common good. They're not acting out of love for their neighbors. They want Jesus stopped. While we know their intent, we can't dismiss the scribes and Pharisees' concerns out of hand. To portray purification rites and rituals as legalistic or anachronistic misses Jesus' point. I'm not even sure it helps to focus on the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. We're all hypocrites. Jesus' concern isn't with the rites and rituals per se. As a child, his faith was shaped by these practices. Yes, he calls the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, but Jesus' concern is for them. Their religious practices mask the evil in their hearts. They appear holy, but their hearts are corrupt. They love their rites and rituals more than they love God. Rather than serving God and God alone, they serve their rites and rituals. Rather than living by God's law, they use God's law to take advantage of others. Self-righteous piety and personal prosperity rather than the love of God and neighbor are the heart of their faith. A faithful Jew, Jesus knew rites and rituals, customs and traditions have their place. With the right spirit, they can transform lives and deepen our love for God and neighbor. Prayer, fasting, worship, good works, are but a few of the disciplines that can make us more like Christ. But for the scribes and Pharisees, spiritual transformation, serving God and God alone, loving their neighbor wasn't at the heart of their faith. Their defiled hearts are what angered Jesus. 
the scribes and Pharisees' rites and rituals were for appearance sake. Rather than live lives of humble service, obedient to the word of God, rather than love God with all they are and their neighbors as themselves, rather than seek the common good, the scribes and Pharisees created elaborate and complicated schemes to justify themselves at the expense of others. Beloved, being religious doesn't mean we have a right relationship with God. Outward piety means little if our hearts are corrupt. The scribes and Pharisees were defiled, consumed by the evils of their hearts, by their love of power. They loved their rites and rituals more than they loved God or their neighbors. When Jesus pointed this out, they were determined to destroy him. Evil intentions, not love, were at the heart of their faith. Thursday afternoon, I went downstairs to let Emily and Jenny know I was going out to walk through the, the activities building to make sure everything was locked up. Jenny shared the good news that there was cleaning up to do under the bushes around our sanctuary. After I finished, I texted my family. Would it be a mortal or a venial sin to plant poison ivy under the bushes? Margie replied, both. Maybe it's time to install a porta potty. Elizabeth suggested, maybe we should let them use our facilities, our showers, our washer and dryer. They're right. We must love our neighbors, even if it means sharing what we have or cleaning up after them. I wondered, what does it mean for us to care for our unsheltered neighbors? We generously support most, if not all, of the nearby agencies serving them. Is there more God is calling us to do? Beloved, COVID has us all exhausted. So many of you work tires, tirelessly to make Charleston a better place to live. I hope you see you're making a difference. But I fear all you've discovered is the reward of hard work is more hard work to do. Nevertheless, God is placing some opportunities in front of us where we can make a difference, maybe even save some lives by giving an exceptional group of young people hope. I'll say more, but for now, I need you to go home. Take a hard look at your lives, your church life, your work or school life, your life with family and friends. What feeds you? What exhausts you? When is God close? When does God feel far away? Is your tired a good tired? 
the result of good work? Or has the mundane and mendacious sucked the life out of you? Take a hard look at your life. Then talk to me. Frederick Buechner once said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. He wasn't talking just about professional Christians like me. He was also talking about you. We have work to do. If we are to succeed, we need to find your place of joy. Yes, serving Christ can be exhausting. Loving our neighbor can break our hearts. In addition, we often find ourselves consumed by church conflict or inconsequential matters. But life doesn't have to be lived this way. When we discover our true calling, the particular ways God has called us and the unique gifts God has given us to love our neighbors. When we discover our true calling, as exhausted and heartbroken as we may be at times, we will know divine joy. Beloved, loving God, by loving our neighbor is why we were created. Such love is the source of our life's joy. Such love is the heart of our faith. Thanks be to God.
Beloved, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The sacrament of baptism is of divine ordinance. God our Father, who has redeemed us by the sacrifice of Christ, is also the God and Father of our children. They belong with us to the membership of the church through the covenant made in Christ and confirmed to us by God in this sacrament, which is a sign and seal of our cleansing, of our engrafting into Christ, and of our welcome into the household of God. Our Lord Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Obeying the words of our Lord Jesus and confident of God's promises, we are privileged to baptize those who believe and those whose parents bring them to Christ. As we celebrate this sacrament, I invite you to remember with joy your own baptism. On behalf of the session, I present Violet Abigail Warner for the sacrament of baptism. Payne and Katie, do you desire that Violet be baptized? If so, say we do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live Christian faith and to teach that faith to Violet? If so, say we do. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed, with love and prayer encouraging her to know and follow Christ and be a faithful member of this church? Payne and Katie, she knows what's coming. <laughs> Through baptism, we enter the covenant God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life guards us from evil and nurtures us in love. We embrace God's covenant by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I ask you therefore to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus and to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Trusting in the mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say we do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say we do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say we will by God's grace. Beloved, with the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and I would ask if you are able to please stand. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And I would ask you to remain standing. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks in countless ways you have revealed yourself in ages past and blessed us with signs of your grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. 
We praise you that in baptism you give us your Holy Spirit, teaches us and leads us into all truth, fill us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve as your covenant people. Pour out your Spirit upon us and upon this water, that this font may be a fountain of new life. May all who now pass through these waters be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Unite them with the family of faith, guard them from all evil, strengthen them to serve you with joy until the day you make all things new. To you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. You may be seated. Violet, Abigail, Warner. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Violet, you are a child of the covenant. You have been received in baptism by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Beloved, see what love the Father has for us, that we should be called children of God, and we are children of God and brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus. Let the people say amen. amen. been received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church through baptism. God has made her a member of the household of God to share with us in his priesthood of Christ. Let us welcome our newly baptized. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ our church to share with us I love baptisms. <laughs> Beloved, as we prepare to offer our prayers to God, we pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray especially for our 13 service personnel as well as the Afghani people who were killed in this ruthless attack this week. We also pray for their family and friends 
and we are grateful that Michael wasn't hurt. We continue our prayers for Americans still in country, our embassy staff, service personnel, their families and others, and certainly for our siblings in Afghanistan. We continue our prayers for the Saddest family, Lyle and Beth, Michael and Corey, as we wait for Michael's return home. We continue our prayers as well for the people of Haiti, as well as those recovering from Henri and those who are in the path of Ida. We continue our prayers for siblings around the world and throughout our nation as COVID con cases continue to rise. We give thanks for all our frontline and essential workers. We pray especially for the communities whose hospitals are filled to capacity. We pray for all who've been recently hospitalized or under a doctor's care. We continue our prayers for Jimmy Dale and now for several of his family. I got a call from him this, this week. We pray for Violet and her family as they nurture her in her faith. We pray for all our mission partners and coworkers as well as our local, state, and national leaders. We seek to bring hope to our community and throughout the world. Would you now join me in a spirit of prayer? The Lord be with you. Holy God, you welcome us into your joy and entrust us with your gospel. In hope for the world to come and with love for the world you made, we offer our prayers for your church, your creation, and your people. For your church in this community and around the world, that your good news may be proclaimed to all. For oppressors, that they might know justice, and those oppressed, that they might know peace. For creation, that we may be the caretakers you intend. For the young, that they might be nurtured in love. For the old, that they might be secure in your care. For those who fight the demons of addiction, that they might find relief. For those who live each day with the fragility of mental and physical health, that they might find peace. For those who face an early death, and those they leave behind, that they might be comforted. For all those who care for people who are suffering and those in their charge, that they would be free from pain and fear. For those about whom we worry and those whose troubles are known only to you. Gracious God, hear our prayers this day and in the quiet of our hearts and minds, speak to us your will. Grateful for your mercy, we entrust these and all our prayers to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, because God cares for all without distinction and is generous to all beyond measure, so we, God's people, are to care for all with generosity and joy. We bring our offerings to be used for God's good purposes in the church and throughout the world.
gracious and generous God, we thank you for all you've given us, as well as your call and claim upon our lives. Because there is so much more we can become and so much more we can do, we pray that our faith will increase, that our practice of generosity will grow, and that our joy in believing will encourage others as we share with them the good news of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved, rejoice in the Lord always. Pray without ceasing. Do not be afraid or worried about anything, but in everything trust God and pray. Bear fruits worthy of repentance, sharing what you have and being gentle with all. And as you go, may God rejoice over you with gladness. May Christ Jesus renew you in his love and may the Holy Spirit give you peace beyond understanding to guard your hearts and minds in Christ this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. 